So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the um, uh, Cell and Gene Therapy meeting on the Mesa. And this panel session is focusing on financing cell and gene therapies, therapy companies. Um, the the panelists, we have a star-studded panelist uh, yeah, panel group here: uh, Raquel Bracken from Venrock, Rowan Chapman from G Ventures. David Kapikoff from Sophie Nova Ventures, uh, Deval Lashkari from Telegraph Hill Partners, and Joseph Sum from EcoR1. Um, really providing, hopefully, to provide you guys with different perspectives, um, not just from the private side, but also from the public side, okay, of, of investing in companies like a lot of you in the audience. And I hope that at the end of this panel, you guys walk away with a little bit more of an understanding of what investors are looking for um, you know when they're when they're seeing these pitches from companies like yourself and so if you if you walk away learning even one more thing I'd like to consider this a success but before we go and start talking about um, you know what they look for let me give you guys just a, a little bit of a perspective of where we've been um, we've had an outstanding uh, five-year six-year run in biotechnology um, uh, at least from the baseline, over you know, some 300% or so uh, in terms of value that's been created. But, you know, and, and a significant amount of financings, right, that have been done during this time period. Because this kind of performance um, really drives more investment. And hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars have been invested into the space and biotechnology as a whole. But that doesn't tell you kind of where we are right now. And where we are right now is in a little bit of a different time period. Um, biotechnology took a, a, a decent bit of a dip in the beginning part of the year, has, uh, has really been starting to, to come back quite a bit, um, but it, it definitely took a toll in terms of financings. And from, from that perspective, you know, let me give you a sense. This year, uh, approximately $68.8 billion has been, has been raised. That's compared to $93.1 billion um, you know, in, in the first three quarters of 2015 and, a, and $109 billion in all of 2015, so um, considerably lower. Um, if you look now, and that was all of biotechnology, right? So what's interesting here is what about the cell and gene therapy space? So you know, ARM does a pretty good job of, of you know, bringing this together and letting us know, you know how much money has been raised in these, in these various areas. Um, in particular, of course, over the last several years, and of course, 2016 you know, is, is uh, no exception so far. Um, whether it's IPOs or follow-ons, everything has been you know, a lot less than what it has been in, in prior years. Um, but we, we went one step further, right? We, because ARM and a lot of other conferences like to say it's cell and gene therapy and group every kind of company that's out there, CAR-T, gene therapy, regen med, all into one bucket and kind of give us a sense as to what the financing environment is. Um, and we went, you know, a step further and tried to separate that out into CAR-T companies, kind of the performance of those CAR-T companies and the money that was raised. Um, and you can see, obviously, during the, during the heyday, um, a significant amount of money was raised in 2015, and a lot of them have uh, significant capital to drive you know, their programs forward. The gene therapy companies also took advantage of this uh, you know, in 2015, although 2016 you know, has, has clearly been less. There have been a couple of IPOs that have come out, both CRISPR and Intellia has come out. And then, of course, the regen med companies, which unfortunately is, has been the laggard in the space. And so one of the reasons we would love to you know, talk about with the investors is, is really try to parse out why, why one group over the other. And also to help educate you guys that not all cell gene therapy companies are created equal. Um, you know, there are subsectors within the cell gene therapy space, some that are in favor with investors, others that are not. And so you know, a couple of things we'll be talking about are, you know, what, what the various panelists uh, in, invest in, um, what's their approach, you know, when they're evaluating companies like this, um, where, you know, how the, the money should be raised, whether it should be done in one big lump sum or kind of strategically as certain milestones are met, um, what sort of value, you know, they as investors provide, um, and then if we can get to it, obviously, some of the structures that, that they favor, you know, when financing companies like yourself. And so with that, I'd like to go ahead and, and maybe hand it over to Raquel and just um, 
uh, go on down, if you could spend a couple of minutes, tell us you know, uh, where you're from and maybe some of the investments that uh, you made in the space. Sure. Thanks, Ren. So Raquel Bracken, I'm with Venrock, which is a healthcare venture fund um, based in Palo Alto. And um, you know, Venrock's, Venrock's a little bit unique in that we have a private fund, which is where, where I work on the venture side. Um, but we also have um, a public fund as well, which is separate um, and, and participates in some crossover financings as well as, 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 uh, as public financings. And so we, we kind of at Venrock see the gamut of what's been happening both on the private side as well as the public side. Um, and um, you know, I would say that we were quite active over the last couple years in the gene therapy and cell therapy space, less in regenerative medicine, um, um, although not necessarily for any rhyme or reason, aside from, um, obviously, as I think everyone's well aware in this audience, there was a, a, a rapid um, and large resurgence of gene therapy companies a couple years ago um, and cell therapy companies that, that were quite interesting. And so um, we, we invested in a few of those, including uh, Regenix, Juno, um, Audentis, um, and uh, more recently, uh, we've actually sort of started looking into um, you know, what, what learnings have happened in the space um, and where could we participate um, in kind of the next, next gen gene and cell therapy companies. So we have a, a seed um, that, that we've just recently financed um, in the space of a, a young entrepreneur that's out of MIT that's, uh, that's working in the gene therapy space. So we usually play on the private side earlier um, in the grand scheme of things. We typically do seed in series A investing. Um, we sometimes do some company formation efforts. Um, and then our, our public fund, as I mentioned, does, uh, does later stage kind of crossover stuff. Rowan? Perfect. Hi. I'm Rowan Chapman. I am head of healthcare investing for GE Ventures. And um, people often say, What's, what is GE Ventures? So GE Ventures is a, um, obviously a corporate venture fund, but we do more than just invest in companies and more than a venture group. Um, so we have five different activities within GE Ventures, all the way from partnering with, we call it the next, the next um, stage of Nobel Prize winners. So it's going actually partnering with the universities to really drive innovation, kind of sponsored research. We um, start companies, so we have a new business creation group where we identify gaps in the market that was strategic interest to GE and there isn't a company to invest in and we'll create companies. We'll also um, do direct equity investing and um, I run the equity investing team and we have to invest in companies where we think we're going to make financial return and they're also strategic. So I call it the, it's not just financial return, it's not just strategic, it's both. So we're pretty picky about that. Um, we have a licensing group as part of GE Ventures that um, takes intellectual property from GE that isn't being used for the business or um, can be used in fields outside the core um, GE businesses and license uh, them out to large companies, small companies, anybody who's frankly interested in GE intellectual property. And we also have a whole thought leadership ne network effort that all happens within GE Ventures. So in the cell and gene therapy space, we partner very closely with the G Healthcare Life Sciences business that sells tools, technologies, um, reagents into cell and gene therapy quite actively. And the couple of companies that I would say are most relevant, there's some tools companies um, like LabSite, which is really an automation tools company that we've invested in. And I'm very excited about that, especially when it comes to um, some of the genetic engineering and CRISPR technologies. We've also created a company called Vitruvian Network, which is a services play, connecting data, IT, and manufacturing, obviously a connection back to G Healthcare and a set of um, customers for that company that go range from academia to, um, to um, industrial, and it's really taking the... Um, the Internet of Things, which G, I don't know whether we saw at the Olympics, the Digidustrial, the Internet of Things for cell therapy. Hi, I'm David Kabakoff. I'm with Sophie Nova Ventures, based in our office here in La Jolla. We have uh, two of our healthcare investing team here in La Jolla. The main team is in uh, Menlo Park. Um, we are investing now out of Sophie Nova Ventures Fund Nine, which is a $500 million fund. We'll start investing in January next year out of our 10th fund, which will be bigger than that. Um, we invest principally in the therapeutics. Uh, I guess we call ourselves clinical stage drug developers. Uh, a clinical stage might be two years from the clinic, but a product with a defined target on a defined development plan or 
um, clinical stage might be a product with an approvable letter that needs another phase three trial, and we've done everything along the entire continuum. Um, we um, have invested in the um, last fund eight and fund nine now in three companies in the cell and gene therapy space. If you go back to when I joined, which is now nine years ago, um, we were being pitched by gene therapy companies and just the sense of the partnership was too early, too many unknowns. But in Fund 8, we made an investment in Histogenics, a, a cell therapy company uh, that's uh, developing a product for cartilage regeneration. Uh, the company is almost finished enrolling a phase three trial and we'll take the product uh, forward towards the market. And so we focused a lot on the, not only the technology, but the clinical and regulatory path. Um, we led the first institutional financing of Spark Therapeutics. Uh, Spark's an interesting company that was basically built up inside of the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. And the leadership of CHOP, uh, the scientific and business leaders, had uh, invested about $50 million in this business before any uh, institutional investors. We led the um, institutional financing, uh, essentially uh, Series B financing, and then helped get the company staffed up, and uh, it's now public. Uh, Spark has reported positive phase three data in, in their first gene therapy product for an inherited form of blindness, and uh, we'll, is moving towards a BLA uh, with the potential to be the first gene therapy product approved in the United States. And then we made an investment more recently in Audentes, which is a San Francisco Bay Area gene therapy company um, targeting a number of uh, well-defined orphan diseases. And I think Matt Patterson is uh, presenting uh, here. Hey, he already did, actually, just uh, oh, he, he I want to say, like, presented yeah, earlier. 30 minutes and, uh, ago. He's involved with this with this conference, so it gives you a sense of uh, a number of the investments that our partnership has made. Deval, Ren, thanks, thanks everyone for uh, for the opportunity to to, to be here this afternoon. Uh, I'm with Telegraph Hill Partners. Our firm uh, we're based in San Francisco. We have an office down here in San, in San Diego as well. Uh, we've been around for uh, for just over 16 years now, investing in healthcare and life sciences, and that's all we do. Uh, we tend to focus, though, less and, and not, on, not on the therapeutic side, but more on the tools, the reagents, the, the technologies that support drug discovery and development. And uh, uh, we're investing out of our third fund now. Um, uh, the, the types of events we, we like are, are companies that have innovative technologies. They're just getting into that commercial phase and are looking for and can benefit from growth capital. Uh, we'll, we'll provide the, the funds to help them build out their infrastructure, expand their R&D efforts, uh, uh, build out their, their commercial teams, and really get to market and start commercializing their, their technologies. Types of companies that we've invested in over the years includes anything from large instrumentation companies that uh, help uh, the drug discovery efforts, uh, Nexus Biosystems here in, in the San Diego area. They provided large-scale automated biorepository systems. Uh, to more specialized uh, tools uh, for the benchtop uh, rare site up in Seattle that uh, uh, helps is I identify and isolate rare cells out of uh, biological specimens. Um, we've also invested in formulation and uh, uh, delivery technology companies, precision nanosystems up in Vancouver that uh, has uh, a nanoparticle formulation technology to help drug discovery or drug development uh, uh, companies. And uh, so it's really sort of the whole gamut of uh, tools and technologies that will support drug discovery and development. Joe. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Joe Sum from EcoR1 Capital. I suppose I'm the opposite of Deval in that we only invest in drug development companies. Um, we are a crossover fund and we predominantly have a public markets focus, so I guess that also in contrast with much of the panel. Um, but we have been quite active in the gene and cell therapy space as well in the past couple of years. Um, on the private front, we were investors in both Intellia and Editas, um, who we probably all heard of. A lot of folks are trying to figure out the IP battle that's going on here, and our perspective is, why not invest in both? And if this works, <laughs> it's really going to be bigger than the aggregate market cap of both these companies combined. 
Um, you know, and I think it's a very special time uh, for CRISPR-Cas9 because it's just this confluence of technologies which enables it to be applicable to drug development. It really wouldn't have mattered if we discovered CRISPR-Cas9 15 years ago because we wouldn't have a way to deliver it. We wouldn't have the tools to show um, on-target and off-target activity of, of, the, um, of the protein. So I think it's a very special time um, for uh, gene editing in general. Um, on the public side, we've participated in a number of IPOs and continue to be uh, long-term holders on a number of cell and gene therapy companies. Uh, Spark Therapeutics, for example, we participated in their IPO. Probably had the privilege of participating at 5X evaluation that David did. Um, we participated uh, in the Kite IPO, the Juno IPO, uh, the Bluebird IPO, the Adaptimmune IPO, um, and we continue to be big fans of those companies. So, so let's um, maybe just dive into what to you makes a, a good investment? I mean, you, you brought up a good point that, look, 15 years ago, you know, looking at the CRISPR, you know, um, Editas type companies probably wouldn't have even come across your desk. Or if it did, it wouldn't be on your desk that long. Now, you know, and we'll just come back, you know, the other way. Now, you know, what are the types of companies that are, are getting you, you know, quite interested and, and actually causing you to invest? Um, what are you looking for? And I guess equally as important for all the panelists as it comes to you, what are you not looking to invest in? Like what, when it comes across your desk, do you say absolutely not and move on? So I would say that, especially for gene and cell therapies, the number one thing we look at is the people, um, specifically people who have done this before or worked with similar technologies before just because I believe that there is an underappreciation of how complicated these technologies can be and when things don't go as expected we would like there to be an experienced management team that can pivot and get the story back on the right track. Um, similarly we are willing to take science risk, we're willing to take regulatory risk. The one risk we are not willing to take is fin financing risk. Um, it's just an unnecessary thing um, and so we insist that the company have well in excess of the amount of capital to get them to a meaningful value inflection point, especially in the cell and gene therapy space where things do tend to take longer than the original Gantt chart might suggest. That is very important to us to be able to get to a meaningful point and have a runway after that point as well. Deval? Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, you know, we, we, we're okay taking technology risk, but it has to be sort of really minimize. And I really do think that, you know, our, our approach is let's identify innovative technologies, but let's see if there's some validation already out there. And it might be uh, some early adopters, uh, uh, beyond publications, some folks that have used the technology, uh, the instruments, the, the chemistries, and so on, and, and proven that out. That, and we do like to see an opportunity where the market even if it's not established, we feel comfortable that it's growing and that there's very low likelihood that it's going to flatten out in the near term. Because what we're looking to do is to provide the capital these companies need to get them to profitability. And uh, you know what we're not really willing to do is uh, to take on uh, complete development risk at this point. So if it's an idea on a piece of paper and someone wants funding, that's just that's not what we're uh, focused on. How important are um, how, how important is big pharma validation to, to both of you guys in terms of, um, you know, a, a Pfizer being on board or somebody else who's kind of vetted the technology, has, has invested in it? Um, how, how, how much does that really impact your decision making as to whether or not to invest? I would say, um, especially on the private side, it's not very important to us just because I think pharma is on the same learning curve as the rest of us um, in such a novel technology as gene cell therapy. Yeah, I would agree. Again, we're, we're looking at it from the tools perspective, and if, if there are pharma accounts that have, that have started to look at the technology and are interested in buying it or have bought it, it helps, but it's not essential. David? So uh, on, on the issue of pharma validation, I think it's a mixed bag um, uh, because it can, in some cases, uh, sort of cap the upside that you might get out of a particular piece of technology. Um, we uh, like co-investing with the strategic pharma funds where they invest in equity alongside of us and we bring our skills and they bring their skills and we help build the business. Uh, if a BD deal happens later, terrific. Um, but um, we, we probably 
Well, we like to invest in projects where companies can control, have the potential to control their own destiny. So specialty markets, targeted projects where, and some of our companies have actually taken products all the way through the market. So if somebody comes to me and says, I want funding to run a phase two program, and the only path forward then is to partner with a large pharma company to run the 5,000 patient phase three, we probably won't do that. Um, you know, somebody says, hey, I want some money to advance the technology through, let's say, clinical proof of concept, and then we'll raise another round, and then we'll do what makes sense for the shareholders. You know, that's a different situation. So, so I probably derailed my own panel here by, by throwing in that pharma question, but what are, what are you know, companies or technologies that you, that you really like that, you know, when they come across the desk, you would invest in? What are ones that you, you just absolutely... So for us, um, again, since we're therapeutics and clinical stage oriented, it really all starts, besides Joe's comment about the people, which is clearly important, it all starts with what's the unmet clinical need and is there a potential to apply a particular technology to fill an unmet need in a, you know, a highly satisfactory and highly competitive way. So it really starts there. We're not likely to invest in the development of technology platforms per se. We're about what can you do with the technology? What product can you develop? What advantages will that confer to the patient, to the healthcare system, to payers? Um, that's the way we, we sort of look at the world. So, the, so from the answers from you three, the one thing that I didn't hear right, was clinical data, right? So we talked about market, we talked about people. I didn't hear about randomized phase two data, you know, potentially randomized phase three data. Maybe uh, Rowan and Raquel will, will touch upon that. But it seems to me that that, that would be, you know, because everyone can define a market, right? I can, I can give you a market, a nice niche market, which is probably unmet, you know, there's a significant unmet need. But at the same time, that data is what would normally drive, you know, let's say my interest. But I'm also from the cell side, so I have a different... So just know. to add before, I mean, we, we scour clinical data, regulatory filings, and um, it would not be unusual, in fact, more frequently than not, if we invest in something with some phase one or two data, we dig into data on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. Uh, do our own statistical analysis and really try to get comfortable with the clinical data. So, absolutely, I mean, it's almost a given for me, but. Um, got it. Yeah. Rowan? Perfect. So, see, you've got us organized in alphabetical fashion by last name here. <laughs> Actually, the way you should have organized us is have Deval and I next to each right. other because neither of us invests in in um, therapeutics. therapeutics. Yeah. We don't invest in straight therapeutics. Followed by Raquel, who will invest <laughs> super early in people who are using the technologies that we're invested in, who then partners with David, and then well, later on yeah. comes Joseph. I think that would be the organization. Well, and then you great. come later to sell it. Sell to, it to sell it to, to, sell it to everybody. <laughs> that's so that's the, that's the way I'd organize this panel. <laughs> next so, time. OK, next time. Maury, so. you got that? <laughs> So I'm just listening to everybody and going, oh, I see the, how, I can see how we're organized here. So, um, so we don't invest in straight therapeutics. We have a couple in the portfolio of what are called minimally invasive therapeutics, which are not in the cell and gene therapy space. So, you know, we have nicotine um, delivery devices, I call that minimally invasive, but that's as therapeutic as it gets for GE. Because GE doesn't do therapeutics, and we are, again, a corporate strategic fund. But back to the kind of question about partnering with pharma. We love to partner with pharma on co-investing, but we hate to partner with corporates who then put rofers in place, that kind of um, capping the upside of a company, because it doesn't make any sense to us. So I'm, we're all with you on that. So we, we invest as a corporate, but we act a bit like a traditional VC in our investing in that we don't um, add the bells and whistles, but we do try to enable partnerships with the rest of GE, and it might be channel partnerships, it might be access to expertise. So we try and bring those two things together. 
So in terms of the type of things that come across my desk that I say no to all day long are therapeutics. They still come. I still I don't know why, but they come to my desk all the time, and I just say no. Send them to us. I'm just like, okay, I've got. I'm gonna I'm gonna write a little program that is an auto set of forward. An auto forward. <laughs> yeah, therapeutic forward auto too. forward. Yes, to you guys. Two of us. So. Two of you. Okay, okay, let's sort that out. So what about in the tools area? Um, so on the tools on the tools area. So. Um, we're very interested in some of the tools and technologies that are enabling the um, CASPER, CRISPR technologies. We're, we're looking at some of the technologies that will, so say miniaturization we believe in, strongly believe in miniaturization. We believe in the data analytics around that field. And the um, third area that we will definitely invest in is some of the equipment and machinery to enable cell therapy. But we would only do that in partnership with a G Healthcare Life Science business. We're not going to compete with them. But if there's gaps in the portfolio, we'll certainly evaluate those technologies at the same time. Okay. Raquel? So I agree with a lot that's been said on this panel, obviously, as, 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 as uh, Rowan said quite well, um, we play earlier. So, so one thing that we actually we don't take on is commercial risk. So we want to know that if basically we solve the technology issues, um, you know, we sort of build it, that they will come. Um, and so we, you know, where there are sort of uncertain commercial markets or there's uncertain reimbursement environments around therapeutics, um, that's where you won't find us. Um, for us, we feel like we take on so much early risk um, that we want to know that basically if we're hitting those endpoints, um, that there's, there's kind of value to be had there and, you know, either additional financing or partnership opportunity, et cetera. Um, you know, one other thing that I'll, I'll kind of add to some of the team comments are, in addition to the kind of obvious reasons about why team's important with having domain expertise and unique insights, you know, for us on the, on the early stage venture side, um, the, the, the length of these investments for us is typically seven to ten years. And, um, you know, the nature of this business is that um, things happen and, and sometimes these teams have to pivot sometimes. And so um, that's why it's really important to us to have um, a really, really good team which not only knows the area that they're currently in but also could potentially leverage those skills and pivot to another area should, you know, sort of the circumstances require that. Um, the, the only other thing I would add is, um, you know, for us, um, sort of milestone development is really important. So um, I think um, I think J Joseph sort of touched on, you know, wanting to make sure these these companies are adequately adequately financed, which we completely agree with. But you know, a thing I think we'll get to later in the panel is making sure that companies aren't necessarily overfinanced. So we want to make sure that sort of milestones are set up, that value is being created. You're seeing, you know, early stages of, you know call it human proof of concept in whatever study has been designed, and that when you hit that, that basically there will be you know, more money to come, more value created. Because um, I would say that where, where we sort of feel our relative strength is um, at Venrock is kind of early where money can sometimes be scarce. But you know, for me, for example, I have an operating background. And so company creation, you know, obviously David has an operating background as well. You know, company creation, kind of helping build these companies with these early stage teams is something we think is really, um, really important and something that, that Venrock um, you know, uh, strives to sort of partner with entrepreneurs. Um, and do, uh, and, and that's with the aim that basically we sort of, you know, carefully think about what the milestones are that create value, hit those, and then more money comes. So maybe we'll swing to, to Joe, because that was exactly the, the next topic we wanted to talk about, which is, you know, how much money is enough, right? And you had mentioned, um, you know, financing, um, you know, obviously financing, uh, can you finance to commercialization? Can you, you know, finance to um, uh, just the next phase of clinical development? Because as we know, in the public markets, you go from phase one to phase two, there's a valuation bump. Phase two to phase three, a valuation bump. The biggest binary risk is in phase three, and then, you know, a nice valuation bump from phase three to, to commercialization. Obviously, it depends on the stage of company you see, but if a phase one company comes to you, Nine times out of ten, correct me if I'm wrong, you're not financing that to commercialization. That's, the, it depends. Okay. It depends. That's true. Okay. Uh, I would say with my public markets hat on, I have a bias towards if the money is there, you should take it. 
And if you, I don't, so from a public market perspective, I don't have the same allergic reaction towards a company being overfinanced, I suppose, as maybe a private investor would. And, you know, if you don't use up all the money, you can always give the money back to the investors. They're not really going to mind. Um, I would say that there are just uh, extraneous circumstances that affect the fickle nature of public markets. They're, you know, by definition out of your control. And if North Korea happens to invade South Korea, what a shame it would be if no one's putting money into biotech and you can't raise the money to, to run your phase three trial even after positive phase two data. We've seen periods in biotech like that, such as 2008, for example, where you know, it, Lehman Brothers really had nothing to do with biotech and yet no one was putting money to work in biotech. So the, the challenge, uh, I've ex experienced the challenge of funding by phase where, you know, let's say you've, you've run a phase two program, you finish the study, it takes you some time to get the data, to get it organized, and you go start raising the money and the clock is ticking and you're losing patent life. And if you've just raised enough money to run the phase two um, and you don't have money for the to prepare for phase three, not only is the clock ticking, but you're not getting ready for phase three. So we often would um, advocate if, you know, if you're running a robust phase two program, uh, take enough extra capital so that on a measured basis you can actually invest and consider the opportunity of getting to be phase three ready so that if you get positive results, you may have to take some time to raise some money, but then you're really phase three ready. And by the way, the same thing goes when you're thinking about selling a company or an asset based on data. You know, the partner looks at it and says, what do I need to invest going forward? How long will that take? So if you show them a nice package of phase two data, and then you say, well, it's gonna take you a year to manufacture the clinical supplies for your phase three trial, you know, they're gonna add a year to their timeline and it's gonna ding your NPV. So um, I, I guess um, I've, I've seen even very good management teams with good quality data take you know, six or nine months to raise a substantial amount of capital. And so um, you know, we started a company, NextCure, um, in uh, January this year. We funded it with a $67 million Series A, three financial investors, Sophie Nova, Orby Med, and Canaan, and Pfizer Ventures and Lilly Ventures. Uh, and the idea was to give the team, that was an experienced team, had positive exit, enough capital that they could actually get to a meaningful milestone. And the management team, rather than saying, well, we just want to raise you know, 20 or 30 in the Series A, they would have taken even more money. Uh, some of my co-investors actually resisted that. But the idea is create value, and uh, you need the time to do that. So, so the valuation part is, is really important in this ability to raise money, right? So the companies and the audience are going to come back and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm really undervalued, and so I don't want to dilute my shareholders, right, at the valuation you're, you're giving me. Um, and so I'd like to raise, you know, potentially a little bit less, um, and, and, and thinking about it that way. What do you guys, from a, from a, you know, from each of your various you know, hats, think about valuation and dilution. My mantra, by the way, is no, bio, no good biotech has ever died of dilution. <laughs> um, but you know, that's, uh, that's just me. What do you guys think? Uh, maybe we'll start with Raquel. You know, I think the valuation question definitely is, is much more of an art than a science. You know, I, I can't say, um, I see some shaking heads, but at least for the, the earlier stage folks, um, we're not necessarily creating NPV models and being really robust about the mathematical calculations because it just, there's so many variables. There are a lot of things that have to go right and a lot of things that can go wrong. And so, you know, we typically, um, it's, it's kind of a balance between, you know, what we're seeing other financings get done at the quality of the team, where the asset is, they all kind of go into a, uh, uh, you know, some thinking about what the, the current valuation is. Um, and then in terms of, 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 um, of the dilution question, you know, I think that, um, you know, I think that the, the, 
the most important tenet is, is that everybody kind of has skin in the game. So we want entrepreneurs to be incented um, and, and, and have you know, a, a fair amount of ownership um, as well as the investors because we, we've found um, historically that that leads to the best results. So over dilution, so, so kind of you know, where Venrock, for example, wouldn't necessarily be keen on playing is you know, a you know, not even lead identified a company that's looking to raise $100, $150 million in their kind of Series A round. It's kind of a big party, you know, Series A round. For us, um, it's just not part of the strategy with where we play. There certainly have been successes and there have been failures, but um, for us, we think that, that kind of being disciplined about, as I mentioned before, milestone creation is something that's really important in terms of, of, of creating value. So we tend to work backwards. We tend to look at what is the expected outcome for this company is the very first piece. And that's, uh, I think, connected to the markets. Uh, all of the analysis that people talk about, what do you invest in people, markets, products, etc. cetera. We just say, what do we think the expected outcome is? Can we find market comps? And if we can't find market comps, what are we basing that expected outcome on? And our models and our capital planning, um, we have low, medium, high cases and obviously failure case. And then we're just like, OK, so if it's a $300 million outcome, how much capital really is it going to take to get there? Mm -hmm. And does it make sense from a financial perspective? And then we look at the team and say, where's the team going to be? And how long is it going to take? And are we going to have to re-up them? Mm -hmm. Because that changes it. And I think a lot of people forget, is especially um, you know, if it's going to take five to seven years, you're going to be re-upping that team mm -hmm. a, a few times in the process. So that's the way we do valuations, is looking, looking at the, um, the other end. How are we going to exit? And we're going to make the multiple target that we have. Valuation, David, for you? It's easier on the public side. It pretty much tells us every day as the stock goes <laughs> in or off. So, um, you know, I, I completely agree. It's more of an art. Um, I will say, you know, we've um, very much like uh, Rowan, you kind of have to look at what do you think the outcome is going to be and how much capital it will take. Um, there are times when um, recently we've actually seen some competition for investments that's maybe driven terms a little bit better, plus or minus. Um, but we have been in, I would say, in the last two or three years, we've been probably more disciplined as valuations have escalated. Um, you know, every company was coming in saying, you know, this is my mezzanine round. We're going to go public in six months, uh, and um, you know that drove a lot of private valuation rounds up. Um, and in some of those, we didn't participate. So, I, I think the the real issue is um, how much value you can create. And um, you know, I, I um, have have uh, seen the cycle since the early '80s in this business and there are cycles that go up and they go down and um, you know you showed us the statistic that well we're raising less money this year than last year but I think it was still something like 68 billion dollars yeah. is being raised for this industry it's you know that's what's great about America right so um, you know I, I, I think there's plenty of capital available for good ideas and you have to get enough capital to achieve meaningful inflection points and that's the most important objective. If you do that and you create value, um, you know, the, the rest sort of takes care of itself. And um, I, just a comment, uh, we had a company in the market recently trying to raise some money um, and they originally set a goal of trying to raise about 12, 10, 12 million dollars that would have gotten the company to a completion of enrollment in a trial milestone. And uh, after feedback from investors, investors said, we don't really care about completion of enrollment. How much is it going to take to fund to actually get the data from the trial? Mm -hmm. The answer to that was 30 million. The market spoke. They said, we won't give you 10, but we'll give you 30. And the company actually successfully raised $30 million. Um, I, I do see um, often, uh, particularly in early stage startups, somebody would come in and say, you know, we're looking for, pick a number, two or five million dollars to start our program. And, you know, then you kind of say, okay, where will that get you? 
and what do you really need? Um, and um, I would encourage people, don't be timid. Ask for what you really need because the probability that you'll get what you really need is higher than the probability that you'll get a small portion of it. Fair point. Deval, you, you probably, out of all the panelists, might be the most valuation sensitive given the investments that you're making, you know, so close to commercialization. How should we be thinking about it? Yeah, and, and it, uh, of course, it's a very sensitive topic, right? Uh, I mean, oftentimes the folks that we're working with are the entrepreneurs, the folks that have invented the technology and are now looking for a partner and for capital to help them uh, go out there and commercialize it. And so, yeah, I mean, it's amazing how often we do hear that, hey, you know, if I raise some amount of money, it's enough to get me to cash flow break even, to profitability, when in reality, it's, it's not really close to that. You know, we, we run models, we try to take as scientific an approach as possible, even though it clearly can't be 100% scientific at all. The only thing we do know about our models is that they're wrong. <laughs> right? they're, just, they're not going to be accurate, they'll be, but they'll get us close and they'll inform us uh, in terms of what the company really is likely to need over the course of some period of time to get them to some milestone. That milestone for us is typically getting to, 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 to a profitable level where you've gotten a significant market adoption, you've gotten, uh, you, 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 you've penetrated into a particular market, and maybe you're developing new applications to, to expand your product line and your technologies. Um, <clears throat> So as we're going through that process, though, what it really does do is it informs us about what this management team, what the entrepreneurs are like as well. And I will say that as, 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 as someone uh, uh, who's an, who, who used to be an entrepreneur, you know, it was really important to me, what am I getting out of this beyond the capital, right? Is this the right partner for me? And that's something that folks ought to really be, be, be thinking about when you're, when you're talking to investors, not just how much money is needed and what's the valuation, but what are they going to get me in the long run? Are they going to be the right partner? Am I going to be able to work with them on a day-to-day -day basis? How involved and engaged are they going to be? And with that, I think the valuation conversation becomes a lot easier because then you've got, you've got an open dialogue, you've got a, a really good level of communication from both sides, and you can kind of hear both perspectives. And that's really important because once you go in and you invest, you're in there, right? This is a private company. We can exit when we want. We're in there, and we're there for, for the long run. You know, we model things out, and we expect uh, to be in a company for three to five years. We've had some companies where we've exited in a much shorter period of time, and that wasn't the plan. We've also been in companies for a lot longer, and that wasn't the plan either. And that's okay. That's that's what it what what it means to be to be a good partner here. Joe, uh, valuations. I would say you know, valuation is a pretty simple thing for us when it's a very early stage company. It's just in a success scenario, what is this worth? And today's valuation needs to enable a five to ten x return in a success scenario because most of them will probably fail because of unforeseen technical difficulties. Um, I would say that. You know, this drives my venture colleagues crazy. I would say, putting my public markets hat on, you should raise the money at whatever valuation the market will bear um, when you can. Because whether you sell 20% of your company today or 40% of your company today, that delta is 100%, so it seems like a lot. But if you have a cure for DMD, if you have a gene therapy for DMD, it just doesn't matter at the end of the day. Everyone's going to make a lot of money. And so, like, you know, there's one company that I'm very interested in right now um, that is saying, we want to raise $2 million at a $2 million valuation, and then we're going to get an IND with that, and then we can raise $20 million at a $20 million valuation. And putting my public markets hat on, I appreciate all the hard work it takes to get an IND, especially in the cell and gene therapy space. It's not a trivial matter. But for my public markets hat, having an IND is the equivalent of saying, like, I put my pants on when I left my house today. Like, no one's going to give you credit for that. So you should just raise the $22 million now and have the wherewithal to get a proof of concept in the clinic, what has been my conversation with them. Do, do you ever, like, not invest, you know, in a, in a company? Let's say a deal is, has, a bank has brought a deal by, you know, and you look at the valuation, you know, and it's, you know, whatever. It just seems a billion dollars for a phase two company, let's just say. Do you ever sit back and say, well, that valuation is way too high? Or are you looking at the next milestone that could even drive it further than where it is right now? Uh, have we passed because valuations were too high? Yes, absolutely. And, and, it's, and it's solely on, on a valuation call, not, not necessarily. Yep. Okay. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left. Um, and I, and I, obviously, we have more um, questions up here that I can uh, definitely chat about. But I wanted to give the audience a chance um, to ask this panel any questions uh, in the meantime before we continue. 
I'm just curious if um, you go out and find these um, just like they would come and, 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 and look for you, or is it only one way they would have to approach you? It's, it's a mix for us. I'm guessing it probably is on the, on the whole panel. We, we have some proactive outreach. Um, some, you know, just comes to us through the network um, of folks that we have. Sometimes it's from other venture funds um, referring to us and bringing us into a deal. Um, it's, it's definitely um, all, all over the board. Yeah, same with us. Yeah. When we, um, one place uh, with GE, when, because we do a lot of um, strategic market analysis to look for gaps in the GE portfolio, gaps where we can invest in new companies or create new companies. So during those processes and those uh, market analysis, we often identify companies that could be of interest or identify spaces that could be of interest. And at that point, we'll proactively go and reach out to companies. But we also have a huge deal flow that comes comes at us and um, one thing I'll point out to everybody is if you've talked to us before we've probably logged it into a database so if you reach out to four people at the same time if one of the you know team member rejects it and then you reach out to another team member the that second team member will know that the first person has rejected it and why so it's because that's I, that, that's a mistake that I think a lot of entrepreneurs make is um, I guess dive bombing us <laughs> <coughs> So, I mean, we, we get things uh, coming at a torturous pace. We also do some outreach. Uh, but I would say our place is a little different. We, we do log stuff in. But, um, you know, I, I think when you've talked in some venture firms, when you've talked to one venture partner, you haven't necessarily got the full perspective of the firm. And, um, you know, right now I'm not actively working on any new priority deals because I've done quite a few in the last 18 months. Um, but if something comes into me, I know who on our team has good bandwidth. Um, similarly, uh, if you bring me a deal in North Carolina, I'm sorry if there's anybody from there, I'm not interested, okay, personally. It doesn't mean it's not a good investment for Sophie Nova. I'm on two East Coast boards. I'm not going to do a third. I'm, you know, I, I just don't have the bandwidth for it. So there's lots of reasons why one individual may or may not be interested. If I see something that looks interesting, though, I won't let my personal interest, you know, lack of interest, stand in the way. The rest of the partnership will see it. But, um, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's a very... Um, it, it's very much a sort of an idiosyncratic business, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we're the, we're the same. Certainly, if there's an interesting deal, we'll talk about it, and it might be the person doesn't have bandwidth. Yeah. The, what I was referring to more is if we've somebody's um, getting us to invest in a therapeutic, and we said, no, we don't invest oh, yeah, in therapeutics. Right. <laughs> and I get to another person, it's yeah. like, no, we don't invest in therapeutics. A lot of these groups, you know, we, we tend to work uh, as a group, right? And so if you, if you do send something in or, or one of us that meets with a company, we'll share with, with our entire team and, and we'll get different perspectives. And I think that's really helpful, right? So again, going back to my point earlier in terms of what an investor brings, it's, not, it's more than just the one partner or the two folks on the team that are involved on, on the deal. If, if, if they are a cohesive team, they're going to be uh, providing lots of different perspectives uh, to the issues that your company faces, and that's really what you want. Yep, I agree with everyone, everything that's been said. So I'd, uh, and I would just say that um, while there is, uh, there are investors and analysts who, especially when we attend medical meetings, you know, we're always looking at the posters next to the poster that we're interested in, just to see what the, you know, what the technologies are, right, and, and, and meet new people. Um, you should really be as proactive as possible, right? And um, hire a bank, you know, reach out on your own network, you know, at places like this, and, uh, and, and get in front of, you know, these guys. Because I think if you wait for, you know, like us to, to find you, it, it, you know, it happens. Um, I just don't think it happens, you know, as often. And, and just speaking of banks, do you guys have, uh, you know, any sort of an opinion of whether you should, you know, reach a bank or if a bank, you know, brings you an idea, you kind of have a different viewpoint of it versus, like, let's say the entrepreneur itself? I'll I just put, I just put I myself in a bad spot, too, right, because I work for a bank. I think 
the whole business is about referrals and it depends who it's referred from and whether it's a cold call from a bank or whether it's somebody that we know and trust and knows it fits with our flavor. The same thing with um, legal counsel. We love having um, referrals from legal counsel that we trust. Um, if it's a bank, somebody from a bank that we don't know or a bank that we don't know that is then sending kind of cold, dropping it in our email, it doesn't, it's not a negative, it's just a cold thing in our email, it's not going to work. The only thing I would add um, that, that this conversation made me think of is, um, you know, don't, I would say, uh, you know, a piece of advice would be don't just reach out when you're kind of in fundraising mode. I think all of us can be good kind of sounding boards even before you fundraise with, you know, what's important, what's meaningful to you, what are you guys looking at now, or even kind of running through some ideas you may have. Um, I think that can be kind of helpful in, in, in you assessing probably who the right fit is at the firm but also getting some feedback on um, some of the questions that may eventually come up as we're, you know, getting interested in doing diligence. So I think, um, you know, sort of pre, pre, um, uh, you know, consultation before um, you're actually fundraising can be really helpful. Actually, I just got to would, would add one other thing is, um, you know, a, a referral from somebody in your network who might know me or one of my other partners is worth a ton yeah. because there's so much stuff that comes in unsolicited, it, it's, it's almost impossible to keep up with the deal flow. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, literally, I, 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 so if I get an email that says, you know, so-and-so um, recommended that I contact you, or if it's an email from my friend or a colleague in another firm yeah. in a bank, that I know, and they refer the deal, it's much more likely that I'll pay attention to it. Yeah. It's much more likely that I'll even open it. And somebody will say, gee, I sent you an email last month. And I said, gee, you know, I didn't even see it. You know, I was traveling, you know, the, uh, I, I'm just not good enough to, you know, track them all. There's just too much yeah. stuff that comes in. Mm -hmm. And we don't, I don't have, we don't have assistance in our place. We have, um, basically, all the partners do their own deal flow processing and diligence. And, um, and I can attest to this, by the way, just to organize this panel, I had to find <laughs> Maury and Lori and, and everyone to, to get these guys because my emails were, were, were unanswered. But <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let me, um, let me uh, broach a, a topic that, that Deval brought up, and that was. Um, you know, the, the whole time we've been talking about what you could bring to the investors, right? Um, I, or what you can get from the investors. But there is an important part of this um, that I think has lost a lot on the, on the public side, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, Joseph, um, of, of what the investors can do for you. Um, and the reason why I say it's lost a lot on the public side is because there are a ton of different types of investors there. There are, you know, the long-term investors, the, the hedge fund investors, or the guys who will do the deal for you right now but short it tomorrow, you know, all, all that kinds of stuff. And so I think you get a different perspective from the private guys here as you do from the public. But a long-winded way of saying, what does a company, when they come to you, um, on, in addition to the money, which is valuable enough, what more can they get from your particular expertise in your company. And I'll start with Joe and come on down. Um, I would say for us specifically, what we try to bring to our companies is, um, is introductions and relationships, um, especially in the gene and cell therapy world. A lot of it is, do you have the necessary tools? Um, it's such a multidisciplinary field that do you have all these necessary tools to put together to actually develop a drug. And so having invested in this industry for you know, combined over 20 years between the Partners Era Fund, um, we believe we do have a, quite a deep network of folks who are ex experts in the field and who have access to technologies. And so enabling those types of connections, we believe we add value to the public companies that we invest in. Well. Yeah, I mean, I mean for, from our perspective, really, you know, we, we do think of ourselves as partners, right? Um, our, our, our team has a lot of experience in building companies themselves before we started Telegraph Hill. And, and so, you know, we, we like to be entrepreneurs in many ways. Uh, and so 
in addition to the capital we bring, what we like to do is to bring that expertise. And we've got a lot of experience, a lot of scars as well, right? And so it would be great if you had someone uh, who was your financial partner, but also someone that could help you avoid some of the pitfalls. And so, you know, to the extent that we can do that at various stages of the company's development, that's, I think, what, what, what a good investor and a good partner can be. From the early days of what does a product needs to look like, uh, who, who should you be talking with to, to d better define the market, all the way to the end point, which in our case is typically an acquisition by strategic. And at that point, you really want to have someone on your side of the table that's done this before and done it many times. And uh, we can add some value there as well. And, and, and you know, within that whole spectrum, you want to have someone that's going to be with you, uh, whether it's good times or bad times. And in fact, you're going to need it more when things are not going smoothly. And I, and I can guarantee that you know, rarely are, is anything going to go completely according to plan. Things are going to go sideways. They're going to go off track. And you want a partner that will, will work with you and, and, and get to the right answer. David? So we uh, tend to um, be pretty active in our companies. I think uh, probably 95% of the investments, we have board seats, in some cases, uh, two partners. Um, and we have a, a wide range of experience in the partnership. So if one of my companies has a particularly sticky FDA issue, I don't know anybody in the venture business better than my partner, Lars Ekman, uh, who ran um, R&D for Elan and, uh, you know, has 10 FDA-approved drugs to his career credit. And, you know, we bring, Lars will come in, he'll sit down, he reads regulatory correspondence, he'll help consult. Um, we do a lot of work with our companies on recruiting, whether it's management team recruiting, board recruiting. I think I've been engaged in this year alone in helping recruit uh, nine executives to portfolio companies where I'm on the board. Uh, spent a lot of time on that. Um, you know, there's expertise in business development transaction. Our uh, newest partner was uh, uh, chief medical officer of a large public company. Prior to that, uh, number two medical guy at Genentech. So we have a, a wide range, and, and hopefully we bring that sort of expertise uh, both on the operating side uh, and also on the strategic side. Rod? Yeah, so uh, as a corporate, we um, have a different set of tools available to us than a traditional venture capitalist. So as, as a corporate, um, there's obviously the capital piece, but what we also do is bring access to the a wide set of business units within GE. So the access to channel relationships, access to partnerships, access, as I said right at the beginning, access to intellectual property. Sometimes it's pretty hard for a small company from the outside to find who, who to talk to out of the 450,000 people at GE. We can always find the right people for the companies to talk, talk to, and we spend a lot of time making those introductions. About half of our portfolio companies have got commercial relationships with GE after the investment versus before we invest. So that's um, something we bring. We also have a couple of programs that we've put into place at G Ventures that the portfolio are, are very thankful for. One is called an Edge Fellow Program, which is where there's some really skilled finance and marketing people, mid-career -ca people at GE, who are willing to pop out of GE for a year. And they're willing to go into the portfolio companies and bring that way of thinking into the portfolio. I'm not saying that a big company way of thinking is the right thing for a startup, but actually some of the financial rigor and market analysis rigor that is then the portfolio company gets somebody, gets an FTE for free for a year, is a big deal. Portfolio companies love it. The people from G love it because they get to understand minimal viable product. They get to understand milestone-based financing, stuff that you don't tend to get so much of that in a big corporation. So we have a very active program there. And then the third thing that we do is, as a big corporate, we have um, a lot of training programs for executives within the um, corporation. So we have a, a training facility called Crotonville. And our portfolio companies love taking advantage of the training courses. They go and get presentation training. They get leadership coaching. It doesn't cost them anything. It's a two days in a year. They don't have to do it. It's just available to them. It's like free executive education. And depending on the stage of the company, a startup entrepreneur may want to go and have some of that executive training. A later stage entrepreneur might say, oh, I'd like to freshen up on my, on my PowerPoint or try and understand the latest in social networks. 
Yeah, we, you know, b being sort of an earlier stage investor um, and, and seeding and incubating some companies, so we have, you know, certainly contacts for um, helping recruiting, helping transactions. We give office space in the Venrock offices that um, we have other sort of companies incubating in, which we've found is really useful for early stage entrepreneurs to bounce ideas off of each other. And even if they're in totally different spaces, healthcare IT and therapeutics, there tends to be a lot of synergies that kind of happen in those in those office spaces. Um, you know, I think uh, I think for us, we you know, I have a, a colleague who. Um, who he, he led the initial investment in Illumina. And um, you know they didn't have anyone at that point to write the S1. So he was a board member, and he wrote the S1 uh, over about a week's time, and that's what they ended up using. So you know it's 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 things like that that, that you know it's Brian. It's Brian. <laughs> it's Brian, Brian, Brian does everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so you know it's it's things like that, and and you know some of us come from operating backgrounds. Um, some of us have some of us on the team have been long term investors. Uh, we have someone who came from um, the White House and and was one of the chief architects of the Affordable Care Act. So you know I think with this this really diverse um, kind of phenotype of, of folks that are in the the Venrock healthcare team, um, we can kind of get you to the right people, um, whether that's uh, that's for recruiting or potential customers or even acquirers. Well, I had a couple questions. One is, when you guys use acronyms, would you please uh, say what you mean? Because some of us don't know what S1 is. Oh, I don't ah, know what it is. Yeah, sure. It's it's the um, it's it's the sort of securities document that one uh, writes before they go public and then is distributed to all of the potential investors when one goes public. It's a great source of competitive information. Yeah. <laughs> and then I had a couple other questions. I guess Joseph is uh, probably one to direct this one to. If, you're a, if you have a, a, a startup company that's, let's say, using a platform technology that you said your company is use, uh, that your company has invested in uh, CRISPR-Cas as a platform, but you have, you have IP in, in a disease area or more than one disease area, is that something that your seems to me like it would be a good idea to go to you, let's say, or your company to team up? Because if you've got your own IP that's using a platform I, technology that you've already invested in, wouldn't that be a good thing? Or is that not a good thing? Um, if you're asking if you have a CRISPR... Well, we have a, we're developing a therapeutic that we're, we're in preclinical right now, and we're hoping to, uh, in, a couple, in two and a half years, be going into phase one. Sure, we would absolutely be um, interested in that type of opportunity in, in so, speaking more. So let me also just say, because um, that seems very specific, and please come and, and you know ask the questions from any of the board members. I'm actually two minutes over my time limit, so I'm going to... Apologize for any questions that I didn't get to, but it is like I'm in a Mexican prison, you know, being <laughs> questioned uh, relentlessly this, here, this so I can't like, see anything. Um, so I apologize for that. I apologize if that was insulting to anyone. Uh, <laughs> um, but thank you all very much, and thank you all to the panelists who, who came. So, uh, how